Hello and welcome to Human Reproduction Lesson 2. This is on implantation and pregnancy. Uh, before you start, please could you make sure that you've completed parts 1 and 2 of the implantation and pregnancy activity. So by the end of this session, I'd like to feel confident that you can state the events leading from fertilisation to implantation, that you can describe implantation and the roles of the amniotic fluid and also the placenta, and also to describe the roles of the hormones during pregnancy and birth. And you might just want to remind yourself of the female reproductive system before we start. So a few recall questions for you. You should hopefully have identified that fertilisation, or remembered that fertilisation takes place in the fallopian tubes. This produces a diploid um, And we've got a couple of really important hormones here. So hopefully you remember that oestrogen builds the endometrium. Now the endometrium is the vascular lining of the uterus. So this part here. So oestrogen builds that layer and then progesterone maintains it. And progesterone is actually the most important hormone in pregnancy because you need a vascular endometrium to allow a successful pregnancy to occur. In implantation, uh, the diploid zygote moves down the fallopian tube and it divides into a ball of cells called a morula. So you can see here, we've got a morula. And the morula is actually pretty much, it's 16 cells at this point, and it's pretty much the same size as that fertilised egg cell or as that diploid zygote. And that's because the diploid zygote is an enormous cell. It's got a huge cytoplasm. So that allows for lots of cell division without the cell having to grow even larger. And over here, we've got a blastocyst, and the blastocyst is what comes after the morula. And you can see that the blastocyst is a hollow ball of cells, and there's a couple of key things here. So around the outside, we've got a trophoblast. So that layer of cells there is gonna turn into the placenta. And then we've got the inner cell mass here, and that's gonna turn into ultimately the fetus, okay? We also have an implantation window, so a very short period of time where um, the blastocyst can actually implant into the endometrium. And if we have a look at what that looks like sort of on the timeline within the uterus, we can see here we've got our ovary, and after ovulation, the ovary releases a secondary oocyte. And as your video said, the secondary oocyte moves down the fallopian tubes. If it's met by a sperm cell, then that would produce a diploid zygote. The diploid zygote continues to divide and move down the fallopian tubes, and here we've got a morula. And then eventually we get a blastocyst, so a hollow ball of cells. And that blastocyst is going to implant into the endometrium, and we're going to talk more about what's going on sort of here in a minute. So implantation is the embedding of the blastocyst into the endometrium. And you can see here we've got a blastocyst, and here is the endometrium, this layer of cells. And what's happening here is that the trophoblast is basically growing and expanding and producing cells that kind of um, embed themselves into the endometrium. Okay. And what that means is that we're going to develop a layer of cells called a syncytium trophoblast. And the syncytium trophoblast basically is what's called a syncytium. And a syncytium is a multinucleated cell. So it's one big cell that's basically formed from many. So it's when many cells join up to make one massive cell. Um, and you find syncytium in lots of things, so actually um, a little synoptic link is the hyphae within fungi, so the long projections, uh, for example, that you'd find underneath, underneath a mushroom in the earth, um, they can be multinucleated, so they can also be a syncytium. Okay? So this layer here of the trophoblast that's, um, that's growing into the endometrium, that is the syncytia trophoblast, okay? um, and that's a multinucleated, that will become a multinucleated cell. So if we just have a look at what is going on in a little bit more detail here, we've got um, here is the syncytia trophoblast, okay? And you can see you've actually got another layer of cells sort of from the trophoblast that haven't turned into the syncytium, okay? Um, and so they would just sort of remain as individual cells. 
But this sensitivity of fibroblast is really important because this is going to form the fetal part of the placenta. So the placenta is a really cool organ um, that's basically made up from fetal cells and also maternal cells, so part of the mum and also part of the fetus. Um, and so the syncytia trophoblast, that big multinucleated cell, is going to create a very important barrier to stop things like the white blood cells from the mother's blood um, moving into the fetal blood. Okay, Normally, um, things like uh, granulocytes um, or white blood cells that can migrate. Normally they can squeeze between cells between the cell membranes. Um, but in producing the syncytiotrophoblasts, in producing the syncytium, uh, you don't have gaps between cells because it's one big cell. So that helps prevent the mother's immune system from moving into the fetal blood and, and attacking the fetus. So this is a really, really important part. Um, of preventing the mother's body from attacking the fetus. A couple of other things that you can see in here as well. So, um, again, this is the placenta is still developing here, so um, it will still get much, much larger. But you can see we've got maternal blood, so here's a maternal arterial, and that is starting to grow in the endometrium, okay? And uh, these Trophoblastic cells that are sort of growing into the endometrium there, they're basically um, breaking down a lot of that endometrium. They're forming these kind of pools of blood. Um, and that eventually is what's going to become the intervillous space, um, aka the lacunae. And lacunae, lacunae translates as little lakes. Um, and these little lakes of blood um, is basically where the maternal blood sort of sloshes around in this space. We've then got a syncytium separating the maternal blood. So if you imagine, here's the, the intervillous space. Okay. And then we've got these little lakes. And then we've got the syncytium, so the, the multinucleated cell that separates the fetal blood. Okay, and the fetal blood would be up here. So the video goes into a lot more detail, but here's the maternal blood, and here is up here is the fetal blood, and they are separated by the syncytium. Okay, and again, that is one multinucleated cell, one big cell, so you can't have white blood cells from the mother's blood moving into the fetal blood. Okay, um, or it should really reduce that. <laughs> um. Another really important thing to mention here is that we've also got um, human chorionic gonadotrophin that's released from the chorion layer, um, again in the placenta. Okay, so um, what that's going to do is that's going to signal back to the ovaries um, and it's going to stop the corpus luteum from breaking down. Now the corpus luteum is really important in early pregnancy. Up until about 16 weeks, we want to keep the corpus luteum from breaking down because it releases progesterone. And as we mentioned earlier, progesterone maintains the endometrium. Okay, so this basket, here's the, here's the uterus. Okay, and you can see down here, there's the vagina, there's the cervix. And so what the progesterone does is it maintains the endometrium there. And that's really important because for a successful pregnancy, you have to have a thick endometrium. Okay, and you can see implantation here. If that endometrium wasn't maintained, then you would have um, a miscarriage. Okay, the video in complete part three of your implantation and pregnancy activity. Okay, and so a few things to talk about with regards to the placenta. So the first thing that we want to mention here um, is that the placenta is an organ, it's a very interesting organ because it's made up of fetal and also maternal cells and blood. Um, and so it's a way of allowing waste products from the fetus to be moved into the maternal blood and then removed from the mother's body and then it's also a way to get nutrients and oxygenated or oxygen into the fetus okay and so here's the fetus and here's the placenta and they're connected by an umbilical cord okay 
So here we can see it's the umbilical cord and we've got two umbilical arteries which are taking deoxygenated blood away from the fetus towards the placenta. And then things like carbon dioxide would move from the fetal blood via these, uh, this intervillous space. You can kind of see the intervillous space here in pink and into the maternal blood. And then obviously that blood would go back to the mother's lungs and be reoxygenated. Um, you would also have oxygen moving from the maternal blood into the fetal blood. And then that oxygenated blood would be carried back to the fetus in the umbilical vein. Okay. And um, so, so it's kind of the opposite, the arteries and the veins are sort of similar to when we learned about the pulmonary system, sort of the opposite of what you normally expect. You normally expect arteries to contain oxygenated blood and veins to oxygenated. When you learn it at GCSE, that's what you learn. But this is similar to the pulmonary system, which we looked at last year, and actually it's sort of the reverse. And um, one other cool thing just to, to mention here as well is you can see in this image, we've got um, a photo or a micrograph um, of a cross section of the umbilical cord. And as in your videos, they also kind of um, spoke about these, but you can see the two arteries. So here's an artery, here's another artery, and then one vein. And you might just want to think back synoptically, so link it back to what we learned about with transport and animals. Um, and you can see the arteries actually have a very different structure compared to the vein. So the arteries have actually got a very thick media and a very small lumen compared to the bone which actually has a relatively thin tumor media and also a larger lumen. Okay. Um, a few other things just to mention. So in your video there was more detail about this but do just remember that obviously the placenta does more than just provide oxygenated blood from the mother to the fetus and take away carbon dioxide. Um, it's got a lot of roles. So um, these are outlined a lot more in your video, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but remember things like nutrition, so providing um, glucose, organic molecules, and also inorganic ions that that fetus would need for growth and, and repair. Um, and it also works as an endocrine uh, gland, so um, it actually releases its own hormones. And we're going to talk a bit more about those later. So we've already mentioned human chorionic gonadotrophin. So the thing that maintains the corpus luteum and, and allows for progesterone to be released in early pregnancy. And then eventually the placenta actually takes over from the uh, corpus luteum and it releases estrogen and progesterone again, because these are really important in maintaining a healthy pregnancy. Just a couple of other things to mention here, because there's a lot of detail when you're looking at a placenta. But if we were to look at a cross section of this, um, so here we would have the, the fetus connected up here. Okay, there's the fetus. Oh, sorry, the umbilical cord should go to its belly button. <laughs> um, and here we've got the placenta. Okay, and so just a little bit more detail. We've also got these chorionic villi. Okay, so remember it's the human chorionic gonadotrophin that's released from the chorion layer um, in early embryology. Okay, um, and the chorion layer, hence human chorionic gonadotrophin, so it's released from the chorion layer and the hormone goes to the gonads, it goes to the ovaries and um, to signal to the corpus luteum to not break down. But you can see this chorion layer has also grown and developed chorionic villi. Okay, and as you, you'll recognise that word because villa basically means productions. And so what this generates is a really large surface area for more exchange of um, gases and also organic compounds like glucose, things like that. But basically a larger surface area, so increase the surface area with these chorionic villi. Um, and it means that you get more exchange between the maternal blood and also the fetal blood. And the maternal blood is here in the intervillous space. Okay, Oops, sorry, excuse my writing. <laughs> so this pink stuff here, that's maternal blood. And the maternal blood sort of sloshes around in these intervillous spaces. And um, these are also called lacunae. So as we mentioned earlier, lacunae translates literally as little lakes. 
so they're little lakes of, of mother's blood. Um, and then the chorionic villi, these projections grow into those intervillous spaces. And again, you've got these large surface areas for um, exchange. But in between those two, we're going to have the syncytium. We're going to have that layer of uh, multinucleated cell. Okay, so that's going to sit here between the chorionic villi and also the lacunae. It's going to stop things like those granulocytes from migrating from the maternal blood into the fetal blood. Okay, so we've got this kind of barrier this in city in that black line that's what that represents okay so you've got this in city and it's separating those two okay amniotic fluid so the amniotic fluid there's a few key roles here basically it maintains the temperature of the fetus so um as you guys know synoptically from learning about water Previously, it, water takes a lot more energy to raise it by one degree compared to um, gas. And so um, actually it maintains, or liquid takes a lot more compared to gas, so it maintains a very, very constant temperature. Uh, it aids development of bone and muscle and also appendages. So um, it helps prevent things like webbed fingers and toes um, because again, it sort of lubricates between them. It aids lung development and also acts as a shock absorber. So please pause the video and complete part four of the implantation pregnancy activity. Okay, little interesting fact for you. So did you know that female dolphins, um, dolphins and also whales um, are mammals, and so they feed their, their young, their live young, by um, through mammary glands, so with milk. Um, and when a female dolphin is feeding her calf, um, she basically has two inverted nipples that sit within the mammary slits. And so when the calf is ready to nurse, like this one here, it places its, its beak uh, into the slit and um, around the inverted nipple, and basically the, the mother will eject milk into its, into its beak. So quite interesting. So yeah, do have a read up because there's loads of really cool stuff with embryology. Uh, and looking at similarities between embryology in all kinds of mammals. Okay, I'm not going to spend too long on this slide because all of this is in the activity answer section. But just a couple of things, a couple of key things to point out here. So there are lots of hormones involved in pregnancy and also birth. Um, so do just bear in mind, we've mentioned already human chronic gonadotrophin being released from and the chorionic layer and signaling back to the corpus luteum to maintain the corpus luteum to get broken down. Um, progesterone, so progesterone again maintains the endometrium during pregnancy. And progesterone is really important because it's going to stop um, ovulation because it will stop the follicles from developing, it inhibits FSH, so it stops follicles developing. It also uh, inhibits luteinizing hormone and so stops ovulation happening in that way. And higher levels of progesterone also inhibit birth because for birth you need oxytocin and progesterone inhibits oxytocin. Estrogen, so this again is from the placenta similarly to progesterone and it builds the endometrium, so a bit of a difference there, and it stimulates the growth of the mammary glands but again, similar to progesterone, it also inhibits the follicles growing and developing, ovulation is inhibited, um, and it also inhibits oxytocin, but also prolactin. So if we look at birth and the hormones here, um, so progesterone, that basically decreases uh, around the time of birth, and that's because progesterone inhibits oxytocin. You need oxytocin for birth. So that's a good thing by having decreased levels of progesterone. Uh, because now you can have more oxytocin released and oxytocin causes the uterus to contract, okay? And that's um, when a, a female is going into labour, they have contractions of their uterus um, and this is caused by oxytocin, the hormone. Uh, now, oxytocin is quite interesting actually because it positively feeds back on itself. So we'll look at that in a second, how that system works. Um, 
estrogen. So the levels here are actually going to contribute to the, the uterus contracting. Um, the estrogen levels will, will drop a little bit um, compared to sort of pregnancy and birth. Uh, and prolactin finally, so prolactin is secreted by the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, um, which is quite interesting actually because oxytocin is from the posterior lobe. So you might remember in one of our previous videos, uh, we mentioned that, I mentioned that the um, posterior lobe of the pituitary gland only releases two hormones, so oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone that we'll look at when we do the kidney. So prolactin um, is released from uh, the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, similar to lots of other hormones, uh, things like um, uh, luteinizing hormone FSH, and it's really important in milk production. Okay, so we mentioned this positive feedback from oxytocin. So oxytocin is really important because it causes the uterus um, muscular layer called the myonutrium. Myo, you'll recognise this, it's often at the start of any words that in uh, talking about muscles. And um, so the myonutrium is the muscular layer underneath the endometrium that helps with childbirth, so it helps contract and push the fetus out of the body. So oxytocin causes the smooth muscle, the myonutrium, to contract. And what this does is the baby's head pushes against the cervix if, if the baby is uh, not breached. So if it's head down in the uterus. And this causes stretch receptors to um, receive a signal um, or to be stretched. And they send a nerve impulse back to the brain. Okay, And then the brain stimulates the posterior pituitary gland to release more oxytocin. And then more oxytocin causes more contractions, which puts more pressure on those stretch receptors, which then signal back and more oxytocin is released. So this is why contractions are monitored in terms of time. So as they get closer and closer and closer together, that's because you've got positive feedback and a buildup of oxytocin in the system. So really interesting, actually. Oxytocin and um, pregnancy alongside um, global warming are kind of two of the sort of easiest um, feedback, positive feedback examples. So in your activity, you're asked to kind of annotate this diagram here. So just a couple of interesting things to point out here. The first thing um, is that we can see the human chorionic gonadotrophin, so here, um, spikes at first. Okay, So as we said, the human chorionic gonadotrophin is released from the chorion layer of the blastocyst. So here's my blastocyst. And the blastocyst releases the human chorionic gonadotrophin. And that signals back to the ovaries. So here's my uterus for this to ovaries. Um, and it signals back to the ovaries and it stops the corpus luteum, which if you remember is the yellow body within the ovaries. It stops that from breaking down. And the corpus luteum within the ovaries releases progesterone. Okay. Um, so you can see that the human chorionic and atrophin at the very early parts of pregnancy is really important because it helps increase progesterone levels, okay? Um, and it needs to release, or it needs to maintain the corpus luteum to stop it from breaking down um, because progesterone maintains the endometrium and it stops a miscarriage from happening. Uh, now, once the uh, embryo has developed enough and once the, the placenta has developed, um, then the placenta can take over the role of releasing progesterone. So what you can see here is the progesterone continues to increase. And that's because the placenta is releasing progesterone, okay, after the corpus luteum is broken down. So the corpus luteum, when the uh, human chorionic gonadotrophin starts to decrease, the corpus luteum is going to degenerate, okay? But that's okay because the placenta is going to be taking over and we're going to continue to produce this progesterone here, okay? And you can see the placenta is also going to be releasing estrogen. And again, these are two really important hormones because they help maintain that pregnancy. 
an little application question for you. So you might want to um, do a bit further reading on this. You might want to pause the video and read up and see what you can find. Um, but the confirmation contraceptive pill contains estrogen and also progesterone. So I'd like you to think about, can you explain how this could stop pregnancy from occurring? Okay, so maybe do a bit of research um, and think about what the answer could be. You could drop your teacher um, a message and see if you're correct. Um, okay. Please could you read part five of the Implantation and Pregnancy Activity? And that's all for today.